Thank you. For those of you not familiar with the Catholic Studies program, uh, and I, the question I get all the time is, so what's the difference between Catholic Studies and the Theology Department? And I think what we try to do in the Catholic Studies program, which is a unique uh, structure which builds upon the Theology program, we, we certainly uh, we rest upon the Theology Foundations, the um, Catholic intellectual tradition. But what makes Catholic Studies unique is that we try to understand the Catholic faith and what the Catholic Church teaches uh, through a, a third medium. And so what we're basically looking at is things like uh, Catholic literature, how uh, are the truths of the faith embodied uh, through the symbols and through the works of literature through the works of Catholic art. Um, the Rome Study Abroad program has been very uh, focused on, on Catholic art and how we learn the faith through art, a visual Bible, uh, through Catholic music, um, through Catholic lawyers, doctors, uh, any, any walk of life. The Pope has uh, challenged us to live the faith within every profession. And so that's really um, how the relationship between theology and Catholic studies uh, has grown and developed. And so uh, through this lecture series, what we have really sought to do then is to bring to the greater Houston community what we're trying to do as we offer uh, a major joint majors with every other major here at the university, minors and also a concentration uh, in the Master of Liberal Arts program in Catholic Studies. We want to extend that to the Houston community by each year in the Archbishop uh, J. Michael Miller lecture series of bringing uh, a Catholic professional who has really learned and uh, excelled in linking their profession to the Catholic faith, really being able to embody and share the Catholic int intellectual tradition uh, with our society, with our culture, um, in and through their work. So with that tonight, the Catholic Studies program is honored to have Mary Ellen Bork for our second annual lecture in the Archbishop J. Michael Miller series. As a freelance writer and speaker, Mrs. Bork brings her education in philosophy, theology, and literature, sounds like a Catholic Studies student, to bear on contemporary issues affecting Catholic life and culture. She's an excellent representative of a Catholic professional who has integrated the principles of the Catholic faith with her own feminine genius for the development of culture. Her articles appear in the National Catholic Register, the Washington Times, and the New Criterion. She also serves on the editorial board of the magazine Voices. Mrs. Bork is a member of the Catholic Commission on Intellectual and Cultural Affairs and was chosen to be a member of the presidential delegation to the 25th anniversary of Pope John Paul II in Rome. She serves on the board of directors of the John Carroll Society, the Institute for Religion and Democracy, Women Affirming Life, as well as on advisory boards of the School of Philosophy at Catholic University of America, Christendom College, the Cardinal Newman Society, the Institute for the Psychological Sciences, the Susan B. Anthony List, and the Chesterton Review, and the Brent Society Award in 1992. In 1995, she received an honorary degree from the Franciscan University in Steubenville. Her topic tonight, as I'm sure you're all well aware, is the new feminism of John Paul II, its vision and challenge. Pope John Paul's new feminism invites the creation of new cultural forms 
capable of expressing the creative genius of women in complement to men. This differentiates it from the goals of the earlier feminist movement. Mary Ellen, we are eager to hear your insights for building upon this blueprint for the new feminism, which has been offered to us by the late and great John Paul II. Thank you very, very much, uh, dear Sister Miller. It was a joy to get to know you. And it's a great joy to be with you all tonight. Um, and thank you, uh, President Devani, for your kind welcome here, too. Uh, this is a very important center of Catholic learning. And uh, I'm very happy to know more about it. Tonight, we are reflecting on the topic of the new feminism of John Paul II at a time when we're also marking the 40-year anniversary since Vatican Council II and less than a year after the death of that great teacher, Pope John Paul II, who clarified and affirmed for us the great themes of the Council. The Vatican Council opened up a new dialogue between the church and the modern era and encouraged a deep renewal in the church that is certainly far from complete. One of the themes of that renewal was the dignity of the human person, a dignity that had been crushed in a century of wars and unprecedented violence. The dignity of women was also a special concern of the Pope as he saw affluent Western cultures absorbed by feminism and poorer cultures steeped in discrimination and subjection of women. It is fair to say that no other pope has written about the role of women with such insight and encouragement that went beyond the bounds of ideology and affirmed her personal and spiritual gifts that are so necessary for her own growth and that of the human race. In the midst of the depersonalization and dehumanization of modern life, where people are often treated like objects without respect, he wanted to find a way to speak to women about their great worth as persons and the role of Christ and his grace in making us more truly human. He knew from personal experience how the human person can be made into an object by a hostile political system. He worked in a state prison camp and studied for the priesthood in an underground seminary in Poland because the communists forbade seminaries uh, to function. As a bishop, he stood up to the communists who feared to let people gather freely for worship. As pope, he traveled more than any other pope in history, affirming the human person in just about every culture there is. He appointed a woman to be the first Vatican representative to the UN conference in Beijing, and he has raised up many women saints as examples of the kind of holiness needed in our own time. He started speaking about the need for a new feminism, and I have to admit, when I first heard that term, new feminism, I thought, this can't be accurate. How could it be that you could take radical feminist ideas and baptize them? But then I thought, uh, we did need a new word, but what? What, what could it be? Womanhood it is all right, but uh, it, it becomes a question of language. What, what is better? And it's very hard to come up with another term. So what is new in the feminism that John Paul proposes is a pursuit of freedom as understood within the context of faith. He was in dialogue with women, encouraging them to pursue more than a partial or a political freedom. I mean, that's all well and good, but that's not the whole story. The feminist movement has always been about removing obstacles to women's freedom. But the question the Pope wanted to engage is, 
how to understand that freedom in a way that leads to the full development of women's gifts. Radical feminists in the 60s concluded that the greatest obstacle to women's freedom was men's domination of business and culture, coupled with the oppressive burdens of domestic life, including, for some, motherhood and the raising of children. They wanted to compete with men and to renounce some distinctively feminine qualities. Many women no longer accept the radical feminist formula simply because it does not speak to their experience, nor does it always lead to happiness. Marianne Glendon, president of the Vatican Commission on Social Sciences and also a Harvard Law professor, likes to say that feminism is dead and that women themselves need to define a new path that restores women to their role as mothers and shapers of culture. Well, feminism may be dead, but like dead stars, it keeps sending signals and still holds sway in many institutions, including schools, companies producing textbooks, and agencies making rules for the workplace, to name but a few. So how are we to look at woman and her gifts and her role in the family and society? Where can we turn to find the foundation for the truth about who woman is? We cannot find real freedom unless we are speaking the truth about the nature of woman as a person. In the Christian context, that means finding in scripture, philosophy, and theology fundamental truths and applying them to our present cultural setting. The Pope based his reflections on scripture, anthropology, and the philosophical approach of personalism. A new feminism looks at what helps make woman a fully developed person, capable of living a fulfilled life and making a contribution to family and society that includes combining professionalism with holiness. What is really new about the new feminism, I think, is the language in which the Pope discusses women's desire for freedom and fulfillment. Instead of speaking the language of individual rights, which sees women as victims of a patriarchal society, the Pope chose to speak in the language of personalism. This approach comes, as you probably well know, uh, out of a philosophy that considers the person as a complex, subtle reality, a created and conscious subject, in, incapable of being reduced to simply a set of functions or rights. Personalism was developed by Jacques Maritain, Gabriel Marcel, Martin Buber, and others, and it looks at the nature of the person and their relationships. A person is a subject with intelligence and will who interacts freely with other persons and seeks communion with other persons. This language of personalism adds a very important dimension to the church's moral teaching that sometimes can sound abstract instead of pastoral. Woman is a distinctive person whose life is not solitary, but instead it is to be lived in communion with others. A new feminism, therefore, opens up paths to explore the meaning of women's life and moves beyond mere ideology and considers very seriously her intellectual, moral, and spiritual gifts. By asking us to consider the nature of the feminine person, the Pope is shifting the discussion from that of individual rights to the question of who is woman? What is unique to her nature? And how do the two genders complement one another? American elite culture considers as almost medieval the idea of an underlying nature for the human person. The culture promotes a feminist doctrine of self-fulfillment and personal autonomy Persons are seen as isolated individuals who form their own identity by their choices. 
This strange notion that persons are like free-floating individuals, like islands on a lake, operating as self-creators is very far from the truth and can really be traced back, among other things, to a Cartesian approach to the person. Sexual difference is all but denied, again, by the elite culture, which leads women to thinking of themselves as almost interchangeable with men and with no uniquely feminine gifts. Then, of course, there are the man-haters who write books like Are Men Necessary? <laughs> as Maureen Dow just did. The, the freedom that secular feminists in, uh, envision is centered on constitutional rights, like the constitutional right for an abortion, and equality seen as absolute parity. 50% of the seats in Congress, 50% of the seats on the school board, and so on. The Pope contends that this culturally limited view of freedom does not express the full truth about women and cannot lead to her flourishing. The new feminism, using this language of personalism, opens up for us a biblical understanding of woman as a complex and unique person who is created in the image of God. To be created in the image of God and to make reference to that, that truth puts our human existence in an altogether different light. We do not belong to ourselves and we are intended by our creator to live in relationship with him. From this starting point of our relationship with and dependence upon the divine, we introduce into the lives of men and women a transcendent dimension. And in this significant moment, Adam experienced original solitude, a quality that we all possess, of being alone before God, of using our mind and our will to reverence God, learning about his creation, and cultivating it. Adam knew that he was distinct from all the other creatures. He wasn't like the animals. He wasn't like the plants or the stars. They were pleasant to look at and interesting, but there was no one with whom he could communicate. And God said, it is not good for Adam to be alone, and he created a healthy when God brought the woman to Adam, he was overjoyed, and he recognized one like himself. He recognized his maleness and his personhood in his communication with her femininity. She understood her femininity in the presence of his maleness. We, too, can find our true identity only in communion with other persons. Identity is not self-created. It is discovered by the gift of ourselves to one another. Adam and Eve knew each other through their bodies that were created for union. Adam and Eve began their life in the presence of God and in a communion of persons expressed through their bodies. It is important to note that the male is not the real image of God all by himself. And woman is not simply a dim reflection of God. The Hebrew word for man is understood as male and female. So the two together image God. This shows that the basic nature of the human person is relational. Just as the life of God is marked by generosity of spirit and the gift of self in creation, so he calls his man and woman to relate to him and to each other in the same spirit. It is through the human body, male and female, that all thought, feeling, great projects, great poetry, art, music are all expressed. The body has a sacramental quality, revealing the soul of each distinct person. Restoring the sense of the person as a sacrament enhances our sense of human dignity. Our bodies are not mere possessions that we decorate and adore, pierce, sculpt, and redesign to our taste 
as is often promoted on the radio when you hear ads saying, have the body you always wanted, or have the skin you deserve. I actually heard that yesterday. Our bodies reveal our souls and are one with them. When the person or the body becomes only an object and is treated like a thing, the possibility of communion is lost. When we lose that sense of the person as a sacrament, which happens in a culture of everyday practical atheism, the meaning of the person is lost, and the cultural and ideological ideas will fill that vacuum. When the creature was denied, I mean, when the creator was denied, the creature lost his value. So Adam and Eve, before sin, did not regard each other as objects, but as a gift of God, and they expressed their love in the language of the body. They knew original nakedness without shame because they were as yet without sin. With the experience of sin, concupiscence entered the relationship and distorted the language of the body. Concupiscence is disorder in our loves and affections. Concupiscence signifies a rupture of the soul-body integration, meaning that the soul is no longer guiding the desires of the flesh. And sin brings with it a disintegration into our relationship with our body. The body then wants to rule the soul instead of the higher powers mastering the desires of the flesh. St. Paul says, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want, I do. The ordering of our feelings, appetites, and our choices to our higher powers is called virtue. Through the power of grace, which enlightens our minds and our wills, we have hope of gaining self-mastery and the real ability to love. The original communion, once lost by sin, the man and the woman became adversaries. Their relationship was weakened by shame and fear after they disobeyed God, they knew that they were naked and they ran and hid. God then describes the new terms of their marital relationship because of sin, dominance and the connivance in domination. The harmonious inner gaze with which they regarded one another is now one of suspicion and defense. Because the man-woman relationship is the paradigm of all human relating, the loss of that original unity seriously disrupted our capacity for communion. The Pope says that both persons are diminished, but the one who suffers the effects of sin more is the woman, who will often accept domination by the male out of a desire to trade freedom for security. There is ample evidence of the wounds of sin in human relations, jealousy, hatred, violence, abuse, human trafficking, and, and even ultimately war, the situation calls out for a transformation made possible by the promise of a redeemer. In St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 21 to 33, we find the biblical answer to the bleak state of human relations. The path of redemption lies in restoring the lost trust in God and imitating Christ, who freely loved the human race to the point of becoming one of us and giving himself up for his bride, the church. Christ actually models for us the way of redemption and freedom, love that is self-gift. We find ourselves through what the Pope calls the law of the gift, Christ strengthens what is weak in us, and he restores that link with God, with ourselves and with one another. The human person can only find himself through the sincere gift of himself. That's a teaching from Vatican II, which the Pope said, I think, in every encyclical that he wrote. Christ heals and deepens our capacity to love, enabling us 
to give of ourselves and to be receptive and to enter into the give and take of communication. The sexual polarity of man and woman is part of their communion. And we can see in the biblical view, this in no way suggests inferiority on the part of the woman. The creator intended sexual polarity as for the sake of our communion together. The new feminism affirms sexual polarity between men and women and seeks to reaffirm its meaning in our culture which tends towards androgyny and proclaiming that really the genders aren't that different. This asymmetry in the relations between men and women is part of our original creation. Their complementarity and unique communion is absolutely essential to the fabric of society. To say nothing of the whole mystery and, and uh, beauty of human love, the feminists and others propose a gender-neutral society, something that has never been tried in the history of the world. It is bound to fail because it goes against all the scientific and biological evidence we have of sexual polarity, a reality that has been around for many, many centuries. The differences between the sexes is profound and touches every aspect of life. That difference begins in the biological characteristics that today are so underplayed, and yet they hold the key to the nature of each sex. Woman is capable of being a mother, and to be a mother is to be, at the very beginning of life, the life of every person who exists. Part of the mystery of woman, according to Carl Stern, comes from her intimate connection with the beginnings of life, a specific form of creativeness. She is intimately tied to the life of nature, to the very pulse of the cosmos. She participates in nature, which gives her an intuitive knowledge that can go beyond the rational and helps women to have a gift for education and for many of the human sciences. That is part of the mystery of woman. The male role, on the other hand, is more rational in regard to nature. The masculine principle leads to an attitude of building, cultivating, and attacking. Man overcomes obstacles in agriculture uh, to do, produce food. In chemistry, he breaks up the compound of molecules and rearranges the position of atoms. In physics, he overcomes the law of gravity, sending rockets to the moon. And in philosophy and mathematics, the nature of things is pierced. On a more mundane level, the sexual differences are obvious within hours of birth. On the first day of life, girls are more drawn to a picture of a face and newborn boys to a mechanical mobile. At a year, boys have shown a stronger preference for a video of cars, while girls at age one prefer a talking head. In a study of stories told by two-year-olds, People were the subject of a great many of the stories told by girls, but a small minority of stories told by boys. Researchers conclude that girls are hardwired to be more people-centered than boys. And there's a new study just out, I heard the other day, uh, saying that women in one day speak 7,000 words and men speak 2,000 words. <laughs> So this obviously means that women have to learn how to listen better and men have to learn to speak up more. <laughs> the term feminine genius, so often used by Pope John Paul, can be described as creative generosity. That ability to make a gift of self that we certainly identify with great-souled women. Women are naturally people-centered and their feminine outlook complements the gifts of men in the professions, in the family, and in the church. I was struck uh, by reading the other day about the new president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Surley. She's a Harvard-trained uh, banker, and she's often called the Iron Lady. She described herself as being very moved by the suffering of the young people in her country because they have no jobs and they're very, very poor and they have so little hope for the future. 
She said these conditions brought out the motherliness in me, and the people call her Ma Ellen. All women have a special relationship with life because of their biological capacity to bear children for which they are uniquely formed. They are the first home of the human person, and they are attuned to the personal needs of the little child, the tired husband, the young mother, the sick grandmother, and so on. It is very feminine to affirm life, to give life, and to support it, and also to seek a culture worthy of the human person. There is also no one formula for giving this gift. Women live their feminine genius in many walks of life. Uh, two women who come to mind who have done so in a saintly way are Saint Edith Stein and Saint Gianna Mola. Edith Stein, a Jewish convert to Catholicism who became a Carmelite nun, died in Auschwitz in 1942. She was beatified in 1987, canonized in 1998, and proclaimed co-patroness of Europe in 1999, along with St. Catherine of Siena and St. Bridget of Sweden. She was a thinker, a mystic, a martyr, who, in the words of Pope John Paul II, became a symbol of a human cultural and religious pilgrimage which embodies the deepest tragedy and the deepest hopes of the continent of Europe. She was very concerned about women's education and she often spoke about the need for women to cultivate uh, their gifts so that they can exercise their femininity to the full. We have three powers of the soul that must be integrated to form our character our intellect, our will, and our emotions. Cultivation of this garden requires occasionally pulling up weeds and planting some good seeds. One weakness she identified that women must uh, work at to be free from is a fixation on herself, to be free of a vanity that tends to center both her activities and those of others about her own person, and to be free of craving for praise and recognition. Daily prayer is a powerful way of letting the Lord open our hearts to him and to others. Through fellowship with him, grace will make us much less self-centered and therefore able to love more. The other feminine weakness that she spoke about, the first one is fixate on yourself, the other is to fixate on others, which shows itself in an excessive interest in others as in curiosity, gossip, and an indiscreet need to penetrate into the intimate life of others. To surrender oneself to this kind of possessiveness is a form of slavery, directed to a human person rather than to God. St. Edith also taught that women should not neglect their intellectual and spiritual development and simply mature in their emotional life. She should seek to be a whole person whose body is governed by well-developed spiritual powers open to the will of God. With emotions under the control of the will, she can have a balanced life. And that really goes for everybody. Another very attractive woman is Saint Gianna Mola, an Italian physician, wife, and mother who was canonized on May 16, 2004 by Pope John Paul II. She died giving birth to her fourth child after refusing to have an abortion because of uh, complications with the birth. She was a woman of exceptional love who influenced everyone who knew her. The Pope said of her, by holding up this woman as an exemplar of Christian perfection, we would like to extol all those high-spirited mothers of families who give themselves completely in their family, who suffer in giving birth, who are prepared for every labor and every kind of sacrifice so that the best they have can be given to others. Saint Gianna chose to live an ordinary life, but in a spirit deeply influenced by her faith in God. She was a devoted physician, 
and she saw her profession as a mission to care for souls as well as bodies. She married at the age of 33 uh, to Pietro Mola. They had three children, and with the fourth pregnancy, she developed a tumor that had to be removed and later caused a life-threatening infection. The baby was born, but she died of the infection at the age of 39. She was beatified in 1994 and canonized 10 years later. She had an intense love of the Eucharist and prayed daily so that all of her work and commitments were carried out in a spirit of the love of God. Both of these women were accomplished professionals whose choices were guided by their intellectual and spiritual values. They achieved a level of self-mastery that allowed them to be fully feminine and to use all their gifts. Last summer, Pope Benedict XVI commented that the cultural attitude of professionalism, an attitude intent on technical expertise, not necessarily integrated with feminine gifts, is proving in some ways to be a deterrent to religious life. Women are choosing professionalism and not choosing the less visible Love for the suffering person is necessary. This has a profound religious dimension. What I think he means is that professionalism needs to be integrated with feminine gifts much in the way that Elizabeth or Edith Stein suggested. We use our technical expertise as women whose spiritual and intellectual lives are integrative and, and integrated with our hearts. I had the privilege of attending the beatification of Mother Teresa in 2004. She was a very good friend of Pope John Paul II, and it's very clear that he was instrumental in seeing that her cause moved speedily through the process of canonization. Here was a woman whose gift of self in love for the poor was written on her face, and it was a face known to just about everyone in the world. Peggy Noonan wrote recently that the Pope knew what he was doing by raising her up before the church and the world because in her life he saw the template for success for the future of the church. That success will require us to use our fem feminine gifts to bring balance and true harmony to family and civic life. We must take the time to assimilate this truth based on religious conviction and scientific and philosophical evidence, and then have the spiritual freedom to live it in a hostile cultural environment. Women need not follow one formula to find freedom. New feminism rejects the temptation of imitating models of male domination in order to acknowledge and affirm the true genius of women in every aspect of the life of society. Women can choose any number of paths that will enable them to grow in freedom and contribute to society. George Weigel, the Pope's biographer, says that today there is need for a witness to a religiously informed understanding of life and the human person. We know that for many years, people have tried to run the world without God, and they have failed. This new humanism will restore the desperately needed sense of the person whose life is enhanced and made real by the presence and the action of God. One of the drawbacks that we have seen to pushing God to the margins of things is that secular culture does not see life as a coherent whole. This lack of spiritual perspective affects relationships between men and women, parents and children. And while many secularists denigrate religion, they also grasp that there are limits to extreme individualism. And even they worry about where this is taking us. Many people suffer from incomplete relationships and they lack real friendships because they have lost their relationship with God. They have um, 
settled for the horizontal dimension without the vertical, and this actually impairs their capacity for friendship. Many Christians, I'm afraid, have been immersed in this cultural atmosphere. It's, it's all around us, and they themselves have been seriously diminished by it. They need to rediscover that prayer is the way to open up the heart and enlarge our hearts so that we will be better able to uh, live this life of love. Prayer and the sacraments actually impel us toward communion. Postmodern thought, though, will not allow any certainties except that the individual has the right to decide meaning for himself. This very non-biblical outlook dominates our popular culture, movies, books, TV, and Hollywood, and it's also promoted by the Supreme Court decisions that are shifting the culture more and more towards autonomy and individualism and enshrining these attitudes in the law. To live a religiously informed vision takes great courage and wisdom and fidelity. To be convinced that as a woman, I have an indispensable role in the family and society gives a woman a great sense of interior freedom to then discern how to live this out. If we are spiritually formed, we will be better able to discern what it is God is asking of us. And then we can rely on our feminine genius to reach out to others in very creative ways wherever we are. The courage we need was described by G.K. Chesterton as a paradox involving life and death simultaneously. He says courage is a kind of collision between two passions apparently opposite. Courage is almost a contradiction in terms. It means a strong desire to live taking the form of a readiness to die. He that will lose his life, the same shall save it, is not a piece of mysticism for saints and heroes. It is a piece of everyday advice for sailors or mountaineers. It might be printed in the Alpine Guide or the Drill Book. This paradox is the whole principle of courage, even of quite earthly or quite brutal courage. A man cut off by the sea saves his life if he will risk it on the precipice. He can only get away from death by continually stepping within an inch of it. A soldier surrounded by enemies, if he is to cut his way out, needs to combine a strong desire for living with a strange carelessness about dying. He must not merely cling to life, for then he will be a coward and he will not escape. He must not merely wait for death, for then he will be a suicide, and he will not escape. A woman could add other examples, choosing to accept a difficult pregnancy and the birth of a child, tending patiently to a sick child or a troubled teen, defending life in the public square against the forces of a culture of death. Women must be courageous to use their gifts in the wider culture and to work against these tendencies that so depersonalize life today. In his letter to women in 1995, the Pope said, perhaps more than men, women acknowledge the person because they see persons with their hearts. They see them independently of various ideological or political systems. Every aspect of life needs a woman's gifts, beginning in the home, with creating an environment where children can know that they are loved and parents have time for them. Resisting our abortion culture can take many forms, from help with crisis pregnancy centers to political action promoting pro-life candidates. Bringing feminine gifts inspired by religious conviction to all the professions will bring the possibility of real communion of persons and promote more harmony in our culture. It is in the hands of women to make these truths their own and make the law of the gift their life. Thank you very much.